Hey guys, I'm Hilton Adair Reese, and I am the creator of Zombie with a Shotgun. And if you guys want to reach out to me, I'm also on Twitter, slash Hilton Adair Reese, or slash Zombie with a Shotgun. You can ask me a question there, and I'll get right back to you. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of Rapid Fire is simple. 11 questions, 9 to 15 minutes for the interview itself. And we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. So who is our first guest today? Our guest today is none other than a writer, a filmmaker. This is a very talented individual in his own right. We're joined today by Hilton Royce. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. <laughs> nice having you on the show. I really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Thank you. So for those that don't know anything about you, tell us who you are and what your project is all about. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm located here in New York City. I'm a filmmaker been doing it for quite a while. I dabbled into all types of genres from drama, from comedy, documentaries, um, horror and stuff like that. And I have to say it was uh, when I was young, I was, uh, I was the youngest out of six kids, three boys, three girls in the, in the family. And the cheapest thing that we used to do when we were younger was to go into the movie theaters every weekend. And we would go every weekend and that was actually what set me off to become a filmmaker because when we would come home, you know, this is before internet, of course, during the 80s, we would actually come home, me, my, my brother, my cousin, and we would like play the scenes out, the best scenes in the film. We would do that for so many years. And it was just something that just happened to like, we would have this camcorder and we were like recorded. Even sometimes we didn't even have a tape. We would pretend we were still recorded. And it's just that, you know, my mom bought me a camcorder when I was like 13 years old. And I just kept on doing it with my friends. It continued. But I never had no, like, idea that I would want to become a filmmaker. It's just because I went to high school and they just put me into the cinema class and boom, it clicked. I was like, wait a minute. I know all these movies. I watch these movies all the time. I know all this. This is what I want to do. This is what I love. From there, when started doing filmmaking, you know how it is. You just start off and, you know, started with film, you know, 16, 35, you know, you know, eight, mm -hmm. super 16, all those things. And then, of, of course, it, it evolved to digital and I started going into digital and, you know, I kept on, you know, I would say about maybe 10 to 12 years ago when the web series got really popular. I started to enter into the horror genre. So I did two web series. One was called 6666 and one was called Zombie with a Shotgun. Their Zombie with a Shotgun actually went viral. Wow, this is like my pet project. This is my my love. My, my This is my baby. So kept on going with Zombie with a Shotgun with the web series. Then I created a comic book. And then we did a lot of fan art, art stuff. And then eventually it was like, hey, let's raise money to do a feature length film. So we did. It took us three years to raise the money, shoot the feature. 2019, uh, the film was released. Unfortunately, three months after that, the world was closed where, you know, the COVID came. And after a while, you know, it was like, hey, you know what? I said, let me just try to go back on the campaign and try to do part two. And that's where we're at right now, trying to make Zombie with a Shotgun part two. But other than that, there's other things that I've done. I've done documentaries and stuff like that. But that is like the main thing that I'm, I'm working on right now. And um, hopefully we could get to the sequel. Why do you think the horror genre is misunderstood? Not only as a lover of film that you are, but also being in the industry that you are. I think it's misunderstood for a lot of reasons. I think that horror film is definitely, um, it's like the essence of indie filmmaking. You know, beginning of time, no one gave really a lot of respect to horror films. And it was just such a passion to it you know you, you brought in your your organic makeup artists and and you would bring a lot of your cast members who were not known the star of the film was the scare the fear factor that was the star of the film the, the cheap thrills the cheap the cheap scares or even the good scares that is what makes horror sort of kind of like misunderstood that you know you, you just this is about, you know, scaring people, you know, F fear is, is one of the most, you know, elements that, that people love and they love to feel that, you know, when they go into the audience. And yeah, obviously, if you have a big budget, you could get your, your A-list, B-list actors. But I think that what happened is that as years went by, it started getting commercialized and we forgot about indie filmmakers such as myself that now when you look at my indie film, a lot of people say, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't look like a, a film with big budget. 
and not realizing that, hey, man, this is this is what filmmaking was all about. Horror, you know, they, they left behind what what horror film was all about, what indie filmmaking was all about. I think horror film was probably one of the last of what, you know, indie filmmaking still existed, you know, mm-hmm. of like trying to get that crew and cast and get that star that stars that fear that story that 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 monster or whatever and i think there's this confusion right now of that and i'm in the midst of it and i think what happened is that a lot of this whole thing with covid and everything that you know a lot of the indie films are not being made now you know they're starting to come back but in the last two three years we were forced to watch very formulated commercial streaming services programming Film, horror films and people still now got a little bit accustomed to that so it's kind of hard to come back to that i think the horror fans are the best fans they're very resilient and i think they do understand and i think it will always be there it's just there's some sort of like back step that took right now as a filmmaker that you are in whatever genre you'd like to to discuss when it comes to your creativity what is your creative kryptonite I don't know, uh, as in kryptonite, as in like what stops me from doing this or kryptonite is what makes me want to do this. Let's go with what makes you want to do it. You know, there's nothing like watching your, like your own artwork, right? And, and watching your film on screen and have you move the same way that you know your audience is going to move. Uh, obviously, I've done, you know, quite a few projects, quite more than a few projects. And, it, and it's amazingly that as an artist, a filmmaker, you know which one is the one. The final cut, you're the first person to watch it. And you watch it, what you just did for the last, whatever, three, four months, a couple of years. And there you are. You're there probably with your editor, by there by yourself, friends or whatever. And when you watch it, the first, to the beginning to the end, and that emotion that comes right to you and it hits your, your soul, it hits you, your body in some way like, oh my God. That is what makes me want to do film. You watch me like, if it gives you this high, this, oh my God. And it's, I mean, you probably understand, our artists understand when they see that, you know, us artists, we, we know, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I know a lot of artists know what I'm talking about. And then you release the film and you want that, you want that high again. You want, you want to feel that high again. And that's what just me just keep on going back is for me to do something and feel that same feeling as when I watch the final cut of my project. Everyone asks usually what's the best piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice that you've received, but what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your filmmaking career? Don't chase the dollar. If you're going to chase the dollar, this is not for you. This is more about money. This is about passion. This is about love. And obviously, you know, <laughs> as me doing this so many years, I, I've learned that. It, I don't know if it was a piece of advice or what I say about advice when you say that is that I give that advice to people. When people say I want to be a filmmaker, I want to make movies, I tell them that. I said, I'm okay, going to tell you something right now. If you're going to do this because you're going to chase, because you want to chase the dollar, this is not for you. Because in the next three or four years, five years, when you realize, hey, how come I'm not making that money? How come I'm not making that? This is like a, not a nine to five job. It's not for you. That's what kind of stuck out with me for the longest when somebody told me that. And I like to pass that down to people as well. When I was looking at your, your variety of documentaries, as well as your, your filmmaking career itself, do you feel more creative doing a documentary or when you're doing like your own personal project? It's just an interesting question because I would say narrative fiction films probably is the most creative project because at the end of the day, it's sort of like you created this story. Now, there's two things with that. If you're going to do it the way I do it, which is raise monies and campaigns and you have totally control of the film, right? Where, you know, some, when you don't, when you have somebody that's investing, they have the control of the, you know, the project. And when you have solely control of the documentary, you have control but not that much because the subject matter has that sort of little edge on you you know so say you do a documentary on on an individual that person kind of has you by the you know what and Mm -hmm. you know he holds you down and you got to make sure that you kind of like baby that subject matter make sure you don't say the wrong thing the right thing because then the project is completely over you know and i learned that with documentaries you got to be really delicate with the subject matter because if you screw up with anything wrong that's it. It's over. Where in narrative fiction, you're in control. Like if somebody screws up, you just fire the crew member or the cast member and say, okay, we're going to reshoot this and do it again. 
subject matter, you can't. So I would say narrative fiction to me are more creative, but don't get me wrong. They're both very creative ways of storytelling, filmmaking. And I enjoy both of them very much. It's just that when it comes to documentaries, it's just a little bit more. You have to be, you're not really in control. You are, but you're not. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Hmm. Well, it all depends what you mean by language as a human aspect or as an art like aspect of language. What affected you more in your life? I think the human side. I believe that a lot of my human interaction with people is what makes me a good filmmaker or a person that loves to do film. And it has to do with the language of being around your own children. And you get to learn when you are with your own children that it's hard. There's somewhat no control of what you could have them in life. As an example, if they go to school and they get bullied and, and them coming home. And when you say language, the body language of seeing your own, you know, your own blood, your flesh and blood of your, your kid going through a hard time. Mm -hmm. And that to me is crushing. And that definitely makes me who the person I am. And, and I think that sort of language is, is very important. And you start to understand about life. It makes you understand that life, life is not what you used to be when you were younger. Life is not fun and games. And hey, you know what? Everyone has different experiences. And how come I have no control of this? But that makes you a stronger person, you know, and your person. And, and I think that helps me also become a better artist by understanding that sort of uh, human interaction of language, of the human growth, of growing from, you know, adolescent to, you know, from a child to a grown up. And I think that's really important of uh, what makes what I think is really important about the human language, the human interaction. What did you first create that made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? Oh, that's easy. I, um, it was, <laughs> it was my, um, five minute black and white, uh, film that I did for, you could say my thesis project in, uh, when, when I started filmmaking and I, out of like 30 people, I had one, like, the best project. I, and I have it online. You could actually watch it on my YouTube. It's over a 20 year project and it was in black and white shot in 16 millimeter film. I got inspired by watching the Heat film. I watched Heat the movie and I took the soundtrack and I took also inspired of an old black and white film about, oh man, I forget the name of it, about this guy's last moments before he gets hung by um, soldiers. Um, and I took that and put it into like an urban sort of mix. Uh, where this guy's last moments uh, in, in the city before he sees his girlfriend, he, he, he dreams of it and he thinks about it, but he just, it's all in his mind and he passes away. And when I did it, I, I still to this day get people emailing me about it and talking about it. And I remember the first time I saw it, I had a standing ovation and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I love it. And um, to this day, the film still stands uh, on its own. And um, yeah, I'm so proud. I'm, I'm really proud of it. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? I would say my mom and dad, they came to when they came here, they came to this country, they had nothing. They lived the American dream, coming here in New York City and settling in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And from nothing, they became very successful business people. They inspired me of like, hey, look, if we can do it, you can do it. That's definitely, you know, very inspiring, you know, from not really knowing the language to later learning the language of just coming here and saying, hey, look, if these guys can do it, they did it. And I feel like I living the American dream for them as I live and keep on doing what I do. I think their creation of also the continuation of their American dream. And there's no doubt about it that they're the biggest inspiration to my life. From a professional standpoint, you have a long running career in the film industry, making many amazing uh, projects, documentaries and features, and you're going to continue to make amazing films in the future. I'm, I'm sure, which means I have to have you back on to talk more about your career at a greater length. So professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Absolutely. People think that the benchmark of being successful is, of course, money is the benchmark for a lot of people, right? I've done a lot of work that, that I did because I felt like, you know, I, I can do it. 
And I did it in my own. I did it in myself. And because I was very um, ambitious and creating these these pieces of artwork that I did in myself, I'm really proud of it. And I feel like that to me was very successful as an artist creating art. Uh, not a lot of many people can do that. And as long as you can create your art, you know, you, you're very successful. Many people see the benchmark as being money. Hey, look, that's just not the way it is, especially in this art world. A lot of people have a misunderstanding about that you know even when it comes to other artwork with music people think the benchmark of being an artist to become this you know, there's many musicians out there you know, having a great career doing their music just surviving and just doing what they love and as a person that has done from past 20 years from doing documentaries to web series to features and doing a lot of many stuff i feel like i'm very successful at in, in being an independent artist the reverse of success is failure how do you deal with your failures just got to get up, man. That's it. You know, the easy, cheesiest thing that people always say, you know, you learn from your failures. And uh, yeah, sometimes you do learn from your mistakes, but sometimes you don't get up. As long as you get up and you you, you keep on going. When you look at the, the great artists, any artist, but as in filmmaking and directors, of how many times they failed and they just got up and many projects they felt were failures and, but they just kept on going and everything. You learn from it. Absolutely, you learn from it. And some failures are your, fa- your best failures. You know, there's some films that, I really enjoy that. A lot of people <laughs> dislike, but I'm like, dude, I, I love that film. You know, I love that. I love that piece that I did, you know, even though it was, it didn't come out the way it is. You still, you still appreciate of how much, you know, is put into it. And, and you're the only one that could look at it like that. That's part of life. You got to fail, right? Like they say, before you succeed and you have to fail, you know, you, you definitely have to fail. That's just part of the process. Sometimes you look at that and you say, it's not really a failure. It's just never pan out. But yeah, you just got to get up and keep going. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a filmmaker or editor or whatever they would like to be creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I always feel like every generation, even when we were younger, we always felt like everyone always said our generation, our generation. Oh, you guys are going to ruin it. The new generation just sucks. The new generation is just awful. You know, we, we, we blame everything in the new generation. I feel sorry for the new generation, right? But the new generation always figures it out, believe it or not. They do figure it out. I would like to tell the young generation to not to forget where film came from. Don't forget the gods of film. It seems like, you know, as, as I'm getting older, I don't know you feel the same way, but a lot of things are getting forgotten fast, yeah. uh, especially, you know, in, in, in art and in, in history and, and everything. But in filmmaking, it's just what I like to tell the new generation is that, you know, just, you know, it seems like there are so many things that are getting forgotten quickly. Of course, we're talking about cinema, but there's like so many things that so many films that no one is even talking about anymore. I just don't know. I just is that the fact that there's so much content out there that we're just like flipping through it? Um, I, I can't really say, but I just hope that, you know, filmmaking, I just hope that, you know, the art, the, 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 the film itself, you know, I, I hope they could still have film that's still alive there. Like people could still shoot and film and stuff like that. That'd be awesome and everything like that. But I just feel like just don't forget about how filmmaking started. Filmmaking is not, it's starting to be like a lot of social media stuff, like, you know, um, like a lot of these social media platforms, people shooting it like it's movies, like those are films now, you know, oh, wow, that's a great, you know, even when you do like TikTok, people are like, oh my God, that was just a great film. Like, uh, no, it wasn't. It was just me just, you know, pacing and copying and pacing things. And I just hope that things like that won't happen in the future. All I could say is that create your artwork. Don't let nobody tell you what you can shoot it seems like you know we have the mind police here and everything whatever we do is uh they tell you what we you know what could shoot how do we shoot it not offending anybody and i just feel like if we start to have the the mind police come in and say hey let me see your shirt and just start taking things out nope 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 this is what you shoot I, and, and that that probably is probably the most simplest thing that i tell them to do don't or create a project, a story, and just doing things and filtering it out because you think you can offend somebody, anything. Just tell the story the way it is. Tell it, tell it with how you like to tell it because that's what it's all about. Having all these different stories from different individuals because everybody, everybody has one good story in them at least. Everybody, don't change it for nobody. That's would be my advice. If your life was a movie, what would its t- title be, and what type of soundtrack would you have with it? <laughs> Oh, 
you know, I love Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I think Frank Sinatra is going to be my soundtrack. Uh, I did it my way. Many people just told me that, you know, you can't do film. You can't do this. Don't do that. Why are you doing that? And I, and I, I just did it my way. And that was just it. You know, um, I'm still fairly young, but as a fairly young person, I think I went, you know, I had many, many, many experiences in, in, in life, uh, especially growing up in the city, Manhattan and everything like that. I think uh, uh, just a lot of stories and things like I'm kind of like an old man in me. That would be my title. I did it my way uh, with Frank Sinatra's uh, soundtrack. Well, Hilton, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. I really enjoyed it and uh, I'm glad to do it again. And uh, I appreciate having me and I uh, and, uh, hope uh, everyone enjoys. Before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you? And of course, uh, you said you're crowdfunding for your second feature film. Yeah, I'm well crowdfunding too. right now. Um, we've got, we got a couple more days. Um, you know, we're still going to, like I said, my first zombie took three years. We haven't hit the mark of anybody wants to support. We are also doing a ongoing Patreon page to help the film. Um, you could hit on, if you Google just my name, my first, my middle, my last name, which is Hilton Aria Ruiz, uh, Patreon, or you could hit zombie with a shotgun. Um, and you could able to see all this stuff, but where you could, if you want to ask me a question, um, you could hit me up on Twitter, um, which is Hilton area Ruiz or zombie with a shotgun. I'm always there every day. You can ask me any question. Um, you can follow me. I'll follow you back. Uh, if it takes time, just don't think I'd ignore you. I will follow you up, but you could ask me any question there. And uh, even an in Instagram, same thing, Zion with a shotgun or my personal, which is Hilton Ariel Ruiz. And you can ask me a question anytime. But for the campaign right now, it's um, Indiegogo, Zion with a shotgun, part two. And for Patreon, it's Patreon. And my first and middle and last name, which is patreon.com slash Hilton Ariel Ruiz. And that is for the, also for raising money for Zion with a shotgun, part two. And if you guys want to know, you haven't seen Zombie with a Shotgun, you can watch it in Tubi. You could watch it on my YouTube channel. You could watch it on Amazon Prime, YouTube Premium, and all other streaming services. But you could just Google Zombie with a Shotgun and you'll see all the streaming services that Zombie with a Shotgun is on. Well, again, thank you so much, Hilton. Greatly appreciate it. I want to thank you for taking the time to be on this interview of Two Geeks Talking Rapid Fire. You can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.